Rasputitsa or literally the season of bad roads is the mud season that occurs in various rural areas of Eastern Europe, when the rapid snowmelt or thawing of frozen ground combined with wet weather in spring, or heavy rains in the autumn, lead to muddy conditions that make travel on unpaved roads problematic and even treacherous. Rasputitsa has repeatedly affected wars by causing military vehicles and artillery pieces to become mired in the mud, and has been credited, alongside the general conditions of winter, with encumbering the military campaigns of Napoleon in 1812, Hitler in the 20th century, as well as Putin in his 2022 invasion of Ukraine. In the Soviet Union, the concept is applied to two periods during the year, spring and autumn, and also refers to impassable road conditions during such a period, specifically the heavy rains of October and the thaw of the frozen steppe in March. The Rasputitsa seasons are well known as a defensive advantage in wartime. During World War II, the months-long muddy period slowed the German advance into the Soviet Union during the Operation Typhoon on the Eastern Front, and may have helped save Moscow from falling under a German military occupation. The advent of Blitzkrieg had the disadvantage that while tanks could operate effectively in summer or in winter, they proved less useful in spring and autumn, when the functioning of an efficient railway system came into its own. To overcome this challenge the German army developed the Rappenschlepper Ost Track Truck or RSO for short. Literal translation, Caterpillar Tractor East. This small cargo truck was designed to operate in the east, where mud and snow made the roads unusable. The Rappenschlepper Ost, RSO, which started its service in 1943, was the result of a competition to provide a crude but efficient prime mover for use by infantry divisions in Russia. Shocked by the results of the first winter in Russia the Austrian company Stair Daimler Puck AG presented a first concept in the summer of 1942 that largely met the requirements of the Army High Command. These specification requirements were four. Fast and economical to produce. Low speed corresponding to infantry divisions. Excellent cross-country ability. High load and towing capacity in relation to the weight of the vehicle. And reliability in all weather conditions. After the first positive troop experiences, orders increased considerably, so that other companies took over additional production orders. The first RSO, RSO-01, had a rounded pressed steel cabin. The RSO-02 had a flat-sided metal cab with a canvas roof, and the RSO-03 had a simple slab metal cab with a canvas roof. Both later types were easier to manufacture and repair than the earlier version. Other incarnations of the RSO included anti-aircraft platform, field kitchen, troop transport, snow plow, mobile workshop, ambulance and fuel tanker. There was an articulated version, the trailer was mounted on another tracked RSO chassis, which could carry 50 soldiers. There were also prototypes of an amphibious variant. After only a few months of duty on the Eastern Front, the vehicle proved to be very suitable for the troops and various branches of the armed forces soon needed this vehicle for different purposes. In late 1942, the Army urged to use the RSO as a towing vehicle for light and medium anti-tank guns or artillery pieces. But the RSO was not an effective prime mover as it was too light and also unstable in corners. Reports soon arrived from the front showing that the RSO had very rough off-road handling characteristics that disturbed the calibration of the towed weapon sights. By 1943 infantry anti-tank units at the front complained strongly that it was almost impossible to move their guns using trucks at daylight under enemy fire, leading to enormous losses of equipment during emergency relocations, which was at the time a euphemism for withdrawal. Their opinions reached the top ranks. The German High Command explored a previously considered proposal to fit the 75mm Pac-40 anti-tank gun on top of an RSO chassis. After seeing the blueprints, Hitler ordered a limited production run for combat testing, before the prototypes were completed. The project was carried out by Stair. The suspension of the RSO remained unchanged, but the front driver's compartment was replaced with a low, lightly armored superstructure. The result was a lightweight, cheap to produce, and highly mobile infantry anti-tank weapon. It was more exposed compared to the conventional, open-top tank destroyer, which had a construction cost many times that of a RSO-PAC-40. 
Although the vehicle was intended for use by the infantry anti-tank units, all pre-production vehicles were issued to armored units, due to the urgent need for replacements. Their low speed and light armor inevitably resulted in problems for these units trying to cooperate with those in other fighting vehicles. The German Army Group South, where the units issued for combat testing, declared the vehicle useful, and large-scale production was quickly authorized. Despite the decision to have stair shift its entire production line to the RSO slash PAC-40, no specific order arrived, and only the approximately 60 pre-production vehicles were ever manufactured. While the first vehicles were rolled out from the production line, Stair started testing an improved version that incorporated a wider chassis and tracks. These changes improved cross-country performance and lowered the center of gravity, a problem in a vehicle of such a high ground clearance. None of the improved version ever reached the front. In October 1943, Stair was ordered by the Ministry of Munitions to cease production of any type of tracked vehicles. By then a new upgun version of the Wyden chassis had been designed and was planned to enter production in 1944, it had a more powerful and less noisy petrol engine to carry the 88mm Pac-43 gun, by far the most powerful anti-tank weapon of its era. It is doubtful any were constructed by the end of the war. Approximately 23,000 RSO of all versions were produced. I hope you enjoyed this episode and to make sure you don't miss my future work, please make sure you are subscribed to my channel and press the bell notification button. Thank you and see you in the next video.